Well, thanks, Tim. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure again to be uh, presenting on Antisense Therapeutics and uh, updating the market on, you know, what I think has been a, a stellar performance of, of the company. So uh, first slide here, you'll see uh, our key financials and a, a company overview. As Tim mentioned, uh, with a market capitalisation of around 100 million, with a very uh, strong balance sheet with no debt, and you'll see that we reported at the end of uh, March, we had just over $8 million in the bank. The company is uh, laser focused, as it were, in uh, developing its pipeline of antisense drugs for uh, diseases where there's a clear need for, for better therapies and where our antisense drugs are shaping as being um, superior therapy for addressing those disorders. So uh, what is really unique about antisense therapeutics is, is that the drugs that we have in our pipeline, we've actually acquired them from a, a much larger pharmaceutical company based in the US. And this is a company called Ionis Pharmaceuticals. Uh, for those who don't know the company, uh, they have been working with Antisense technology for over 30 years. Uh, and they are clearly the leader in development and commercialization of these Antisense molecules. And so we have worldwide exclusive licenses from Ionis to two drugs uh, that, uh, that we are looking to develop and, and commercialize. A little bit more on Ionis. Uh, they have now three approved drugs. One of those is a blockbuster drug that they've partnered with Biogen. Uh, last quarter sales were over 500 million. Interestingly, and I think very relevantly, being developed for a rare disorder in children called spinal muscular atrophy. And that drug is actually on track to be a $2 billion selling drug in its again, in a rare CNS uh, disease in children. So we're very fortunate to have partnered early in the game with Ionis, you know, who now, since we've, uh, since we've set up our relationship, have uh, collaborations with companies like Pfizer, Roche, Bayer, AstraZeneca, and as I mentioned, Biogen. So we are an elite company in looking to develop and commercialise that technology. And I think that is a feature of the company. Perhaps it's uh, been uh, sort of uh, underestimated by, by the market. Uh, major shareholders, Platinum Asset Management, they are a global equities investment firm, 25 billion under management, have a dedicated healthcare fund with uh, international fund with uh, $600 million uh, portfolio. So again, we think that's a, a tremendous validation of antisense therapeutics, given that they've come in, been supportive of the company, been a major shareholder now for over three years. Uh, you'll see there on the slide, we've listed the very broad-based uh, analyst coverage. Those names, for those familiar with the biotech sector, would you know, see them as being uh, recognised as the sort of most experienced and the highest profile sell-side analysts in, in the sector. So again, very uh, significant uh, validation, we believe, for the Antisense story, seeing each one of those analysts having positive uh, buy recommendations on the stock. And you can get onto our website to see, uh, see those uh, research reports. I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, the lead program, as Tim said, is for this rare um, muscular disease in boys, uh, young boys called Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We're sitting you know, in, a, in a, an exceptional position with a very positive phase two clinical trial data. Go to the next slide, thanks, Tim. And, you know, I, I think, you know, when it comes to contemplating our lead program, I really do believe that, uh, you know, we really, this program's unrivaled. Uh, as you, you know, line it up with any uh, biotech peer locally, or, you know, I think, um, you know, even be fair to say internationally. Uh, and, you know, I, I think it's evident through the, through the features of the, of the program that we've listed here. Uh, you know, we have a novel and differentiated mechanism of action of the drug. We're the only company in the world that's developing a drug that's targeting a known uh, actor in the uh, inflammatory process of uh, human disease. And we've shown that drug to be active in boys with uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. But we also think it's got very broad application across a, um, a range of inflammatory diseases. Uh, we're in a market... Uh, where the only therapy that's available to treat boys today is a drug that was first approved 60 years ago. Modest activity, 
but comes with a litany of, of side effects. So we really do think we're uniquely positioned with a drug that can be more effective and safer than the only therapy that's available for, for this patient population. Our mechanism of action it allows our, us to consider our drug being used as a monotherapy or to be used in combination with existing drugs that are on the market to treat Duchenne's and also that is that are coming through development. So we think that uh, positions us uh, where we can avoid our head to head competition with uh, other uh, drugs and giving ourselves uh, an opportunity to sort of benefit from the high levels of market penetration that come when you've got a drug that can be used alongside other therapies for treating the disease. Phase two clinical, positive phase two clinical trial, uh, trial data that's been recognised by um, experts in the field, regulatory authorities that we presented it to, and uh, a, an outstanding IP position, not only based on the patents that we filed ourselves, but recently receiving orphan drug designations in both ES, sorry, the EU and US, biggest pharmaceutical markets in the world, where we get additional market exclusivity. So, you know, we're playing in a market in Duchenne's that's uh, going to, you know, we're thought to be valued by uh, 2030, as high as 10 billion with very limited competition. Uh, next slide, thanks, Tim. So uh, what is Duchenne's? As I mentioned earlier, it is a rare uh, a genetic disorder of boys. Uh, it's caused by a faulty gene that prevents these boys from being able to make enough of a, a key protein for muscle function called dystrophin. The lack of dystrophin in the boys' muscles leads to inflammation in the muscles and associated fibrosis and, and eventually to the death of the muscle tissue. Uh, it is uh, a rare disease, but it actually has the unfortunate uh, reputation of being the most common lethal uh, genetic disorder. So uh, it, it, its prevalence is, is quite significant. The key challenge uh, for these boys uh, is to try and dampen down that inflammation in the muscles that leads to the progressive muscle loss. And so, as I mentioned earlier, the only way that's being treated today is by using a category of drugs that have been used for 60 years. They're very blunt in the way in which they work, modest activity, uh, and cause some very serious side effects. But having said that, because they are all the only game in town, physicians are starting uh, boys on these therapies as early as two years of age. So there really is a desperate need for a better way to address the therapy. That's what we think that we, we have in our portfolio here. Next slide, thanks, Tim. So uh, we ran a phase two clinical trial here at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne, and where we came out with you know, excellent uh, preliminary uh, phase two clinical trial data. I'm, I, and I might just pause there because, you know, those that are investors in, in uh, biotech would ask them maybe to contemplate the, uh, those companies that they are uh, invested in at the present time and, and how many of those would have positive phase two clinical trial data on uh, showing benefits on the endpoints that would be relevant to the approval of the drug. I hazard to say very few companies. And I think the importance of that is that the significant de-risking that we bought by being able to deliver on this phase two clinical trial data. Many, many companies fall over at this point. Uh, and we set ourselves up here, we think, you know, in a, a very exciting fashion to be able to advance the pro program towards uh, commercialization with the de-risking of being able to say our drugs actually working in the disease that we're looking to treat. I won't go into the details of the of uh, the slide here and the data that we presented. The, uh, the quote there really does encapsulate what we've delivered on. We've you know, positive data across multiple measures of muscle strength and function in these boys, and really uh, uh, setting us up for the next phase of development of the drug. Uh, next slide, thanks, Tim. Speaking of which, um, this is the the next steps in the development of H1102 for these boys with Duchenne's. We're planning a phase two clinical, uh, phase two B clinical trial that we're looking to conduct in Europe. We're well advanced in that planning. We've had um, multiple interactions with the European regulatory authorities. We submitted last month what's known as our pediatric investigational plan, which had the synopsis for our phase two clinical trial to point out that this phase two B study that we're looking to run 
we are, and all the dialogue that we have with the European regulatory authorities is to set it up as a potentially approvable study. So this next study could get us a, an approval, what's known as a conditional approval in Europe. So as I've emphasised before, potentially one study away from being able to market the drug in the second biggest uh, pharmaceutical market in the world. So we are waiting for uh, feedback on that um, PIP submission uh, to what's known as the Paediatric Development Committee of the European Medicines Agency. Uh, sub, uh, subsequent to receiving that feedback, we'll be looking to submit our trial application. We're expecting to do that this quarter. First approvals to come through in the third quarter, be able to start the study in the fourth quarter of this year. Again, a study that could see us an approval. And to point out that the endpoints for those studies are essentially the same ones that we've been able to show positive activity on in our six month study that we ran at the Royal Children's Hospital. Uh, in parallel with our uh, plans for advancing the drug in Europe, we've got, uh, we've been uh, moving forward uh, with our planning for the uh, US, positive interactions recently with the uh, FDA through a type C meeting, looking forward to be able to uh, come to market with further details of that at the end of the month, once we get the official uh, meeting minutes, uh, as I said, it, due at the end of May. And next slide, thanks. Uh, not time really to, uh, to go into the development landscape, just two key features I'd highlight. Very limited competition in the non-ambulance space where we're uh, playing one only company that has an active clinical program. The other point is we expect our drug to be able to be used in combination with existing therapies and those that are in development. So we think we're sitting uniquely in terms of our uh, competitive position. Next slide, thanks. Uh, we, we are very excited about the drug's potential application in other inflammatory diseases based on the data we've developed today. We've been filing new patents around its application in those other diseases. We really like the opportunity to expand in the neuroinflammation, neuromuscular disease area into the rare disease applications where there's a need for better therapies, being able to move forward into clinical trials that are less expensive and quicker to move towards uh, commercialization. But we still see this drug as having, you know, a potential in some of the larger uh, disease indications as well too. So this is really something, you know, for our shareholders to look forward to as we advance the program beyond the shins. Next slide. Again, really um, no time to go into market uh, uh, details on the call here today. Just point out a couple of key features. I've already talked about the DMD market, 10 billion by 2030. The global anti-inflammatory market, one of the biggest pharmaceutical markets, you know, I think it's just second to the cancer drug market. It's gonna be $200 million market by 2027. Both um, uh, markets that we think will be able to take a substantial position in. Uh, have we uh, undertook a peer comparison with some uh, selected companies in the US? So peers uh, listed on NASDAQ, you'll see there, you know, the value between 160 US to 2.5 billion. So we still think there's lots of value there to be uh, delivered based on where we are today, let alone the uh, news flow that we're expecting to see. Speaking of which, go to the next slide. But uh, just wanted to point out uh, in the last 12 months, we've delivered on 11 key milestones, 11. So again, you know, have a look at companies that you're, um, you're backing. Uh, I venture to say that uh, we would be in uh, rare, uh, rare company indeed by being able to show that we could deliver on, uh, on that uh, level of uh, you know, catalyst uh, drivers, but also news flow. We've got some key ones coming up in the in the next uh, next quarter, and 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 I think that this in our ability to deliver uh, as we have done in the last twelve months reflects the experience and the dedication of the Antisense team. But the benefit of us working on a platform technology, as I said, where there's already a two billion dollar selling drug on the market, and I think the next slide, thanks Tim, the last one for me talks to, you know, the, um, I think the, the confidence that uh, investors should have in our ability to be able to deliver on these key near-term catalysts. And they are around advancing the program with the US regulatory authorities, moving forward with the successful manufacture of our drug compound for phase 2B clinical trials, coming to market with news on our new, uh, new indications, so adding value beyond what we've already delivered in Duchenne's, 
and also the advancement of our program into this phase two B study in Europe, which is, you know, we are endeavouring uh, to deliver on, could be uh, an approvable study. And so, Tim, I'll uh, I'll stop there and uh, <laughs> take uh, take questions. It's a big it's a big story for ten minutes. Thank you, Mark. Um, now you've just recently made some uh, senior appointments in regards to the board. Uh, Dr. Charmaine Gilson from uh, XCSL, Professor Tom Voigt, and then there was Dr. Gil Price that we we spoke about. Now, can you tell us a little bit more about Dr. Gil Price in particular, given his background with uh, Sarepta and how he moved that from a or built that from a eighty million dollar company to a multi billion dollar company in a very similar space? Yeah, thanks, Tim. And and you know that is really a very a significant appointment of a company. So, uh, Gil is you know our US based uh, consultant medical director. And he was uh, an ex-director of Sarepta Therapeutics. Uh, Sarepta Therapeutics are the biggest player in the Duchenne world. You know, they've got three marketed products in the US, addressing only, I think, 20% of, of, the, of the Duchenne's market, but today selling, I think, on track to sell over half a billion dollars US annually. And, uh, you know, Gil, as you correctly stated, Tim, uh, was there on the ground when the company had started their uh, program in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. And so, in fact, I think um, the market cap might have even been less than what you stated, 80, 80 million. So um, along with Gil, of course, we had the ex-chairman of Sarepta, Gil, uh, Bill Goolsby, who's on my board as a non-executive director. And both Gil and Bill were there, you know, when they started the program in Duchenne's and advanced it all the way through to approval, you know, first approval in the US and saw the company's market cap run from you know, the you know, 60, 80 million up to, I think it, it peaked at 3 billion on, on approval, you know, of the drug in, in the US. So, you know, look, I, you know, very excited to, you know, to have both of those um, executives involved in the business. I think if you're on, if they were on the call today, you know, they would um, say that, you know, that the reason for, you know, partnering with a, a, com a small biotech company other side of the world, having to deal with the challenges of uh, the litany of, uh, you know, time, uh, uh, differences uh, is because they, of the potential that they see in our drug and ability to repeat, you know, what they did at uh, at Sarepta. So, you know, thanks for pointing that out. Time, you know, doesn't prevent for us to, you know, um, uh, sort of present as an opportunity to, to talk about who's in the company and who's supporting us, but they are two key appointments, along with Charmaine Gittleson, who you highlighted, who's just come on to our board as a non-executive director. Uh, Shaimane was uh, medical uh, director at CSL and in her time there was running their R&D portfolio of over 400 staff uh, globally and a, uh, an R&D budget of 400 million. So we are the first company, Tim, you know, after uh, retiring from an executive role, uh, public company that she's gone onto the board of and, and she brings her very uh, relevant rare disease experience but, but very, very deep knowledge of um, product and drug development. And again, I think that appointment you know, does, uh, I think, speak highly, I believe, of the qualities of antisense therapeutics and the potential. Uh, and But also, you know, the confidence that these executives have on our ability to, to deliver on our, uh, on our plans.